biopsy without having a clear data, especially the population. So that's also what we suggest. Next, please. Yeah, selanjutnya. Macet. Berikutnya. Masih macet. Jadi kalau lama sebenarnya kelamaan di berikutnya. Ya. Yeah. Oke, okay. masih yang sama selanjutnya silakan. Sudah selesai kayaknya nih. Lanjut. Ini masih sama kayak yang tadi. Oh ya, mungkin ini ada tambahan mengenai AMR ya. Kita bisa meneliti bagaimana cemaran air dan polusi di apa daerah sekitar buangan yang ada human animal konfliknya terhadap bakteri yang Ya. Yeah. Oke. Okay. Next, this is another uh, what we have done also using a thermal camera to produce to predict uh, the animal health. And then next, I think this is the last slide. Okay. That's for us. So again, the key is that the animals taking. as our suggestions. Okay, thank you so much and I would like to give the time back to the moderator. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you Dr. Huda for uh, the presentation and then uh, regarding listen learn in Makaka Fascicularis study at uh, Primate Research Center and also education of uh, Parameptology study program. So uh, we will continue for Dr. Prameswari presentation. So we uh, invite again uh, to come forward dr Prameswari. yeah okay. uh, thank you dr huda i will not take the five uh, the five minutes maybe for other sorry for uh take a longer time so i will continue maybe because it's already uh, talking about yeah, i'm talking about the urban primate in the capital city next uh, maybe about slide nine or ten. Uh, next. Okay, next, next. After Malaysia. Yes, uh, no, no, before. Huh? Yep, okay. So let's talk about the conflict in Indonesia, the Macaques conflict, but based on the news. This morning, uh, we heard about from Ibu Director about uh, the database and then uh, Pak Kurnia Ilham with the journal. I will talk about the news because uh, the conflict also appeared in the online Indonesian news. So we only took like a two years, uh, 2019 until 2021. And pretty similar actually with the, with the database that presented mostly the conflict from the news appear in Java. So, but from this news, it's mixed up between wild population, uh, maybe expat or escape monkey. So it seems to be like overcrowded in Java with the conflict issue. So be careful with the news. Next. So we see how is the trend. Uh, I will translate it a little bit on the blue color. You can see on 2019, the conflict news is way higher than 2020 on 2021. I don't know, maybe because of the COVID pandemic or something else. And then there is about the news about the information of long-term macaques and also education and penindakan like law enforcement. So we see on 2020 and 2021, the news that we collected uh, uh, talking about the exploitation as well. So in total, all the news that we collect this is around 800 something from 250 news media. And you get and uh, on the table underneath is a trend about the conflict uh, based on where the monkey come from. So the monkey is like a, a wild population with the orange color. And Lepasan is like expat, the monkey who escaped or unwanted release from the owner. And from the 
Topeng Monyet and also from the trade and also from a pet. And the news is higher for the uh, wild population from 2019 to 2021. Next. And this is about the area. The blue one is mostly happening in Pemukiman or uh, housing area. Uh, we don't know why. It could be because of the in the Pumukiman, more people, more people active with social media and become viral. So the news will be uh, up. Oh yeah, by the way, this, this news is scrapping. So we avoid any double counting of the news. So it's different. So it's uh, one by one. And then we also talk about the a loss uh, between human and an animal. From the human is about traumatic, a one, a wounded, or maybe it's like about the cropping, uh, red, red cropping, or in uh, Ternak is like a farm animals also maybe it affected. And then there is uh, not many information we can get from the animal side. So unknown from the news. So they just said about the conflict, but they don't know what, what they do with the conflict. So mostly like 90, 69% uh, is unknown. But 70% is like uh, they will catch the macaques. Or 6% or 7%, uh, the animal found dead. Could be shooting, could be poisoning, anything. And how is the media sentiment in Indonesia with the long-term macaque for the conflict? It's always negative. Next. OK. So I'm um, talking about our small studies together with uh, BKSD Jakarta, Naturis of Jakarta, in north coastal area of Jakarta, it's a mangrove habitat. So they have a, like a mangrove, uh, you can see the color like the yellow and then the purple and the green. Uh, there are around 300 macaques on 2019, with the total area is around 300 hectares. So the density population is around 0 0.08 until 4.27 individual per hectare. So you can see how is the fragmented area. It's all about a uh, human settlement. They're really squeezed in the fragmented in the, in the corner. Next. And uh, our area that we study is uh, Muara Angke Wildlife Reserve. It's only 25 hectares actually. And since 1998, from the uh, Surat Keputusan uh, this area function is for the conservation area for the water bird and a long term macaques. So, in that area, you can see the dot. There is a three different color of dot. Uh, the green one, the green one is, a, we call it a church group, atau kelompok gereja. And the red one is the uh, road group, atau jalan raya. And the, Yellow small dot is Kelompok Dermaga. So it's uh, the smallest one. In total, we have uh, 117. And then at the moment, uh, eh, sorry, before we cannot go inside of the habitat because it's mostly a mangrove area, you cannot enter. So for the counting, we do the direct count. We wait for them to be appear next to the fence or something so we can calculate them because we can't go inside, it's a, like a it's like a lake, not salt water lake, it's like a lake. And then now, at the habitat, there is a, like a habitat rehabilitation for mangrove by Yekan and BKSDA Jakarta since 2022. So we hope in the future this habitat will be better for the long term macaque in Jakarta. Next. So back a bit on 2019 actually before we start the uh, Muara Angke uh, Wildlife Reserve, we did the resident social survey, 100 residents who lived there, and then we asked them how is their perception about the macaques. Actually, they understand that macaques live first than them there. So before they build the house, the macaques are already there. And then they think about, yeah, they agree like 53% that maybe they make a trouble with us, but 42% maybe not. And Maybe the people get bullied, maybe only 34% and 64 no. And yeah, almost also that they're scared of the macaques, 
but they understand that people in the resident they are not allowed to feed the macaques in their house next and what is the potential conflict in Muara Angke uh, Wildlife Reserve is similar with other capital city macaques always attract people to come to see that it's a part of the tourist, it's a part of attraction, it's a part of a fun thing for the family. So as you see, it's a main road actually, a main road in the North Jakarta when people can come to a tourism, a, another tourist attraction, not this one. So this one is like a, the car stop by. Uh, they, want, they bring a family actually, they bring a children. They want to see the macaques and become a traffic jam there. And someone maybe bring a macaque they want to release because there's the only forest left in, in, in Jakarta. So they want to release macaque. It's not only once, maybe many times. Once we got a, uh, one person with nine macaques in the car for release in uh, Muara Angke. And also again about waste management. Uh, with, with this, we talk with the developer and then uh, they make a a good improvement with asking uh, for the uh, cleaning uh, staff to come more early than uh, macaques wake up. Next. Next. Oops. Hello. It's stuck or? Okay, wait. <laughs> okay, and again, during the small study, oops. <laughs> okay, and the time, uh, at the same time, during the small study, we also taking a, uh, about what people do actually with macaques. So there are three different activities that we see like a provisioning taking a picture and just sightseeing and then it's a pot bigger potential conflict uh so you see in the 2020 there are a lot of people provisioning and then at the moment it's like it's still beginning of the pandemic even in the pandemic they still come and feed the monkey and then when we start to inter intervene them with the people our staff uh, mon monkey guard is coming they try to recognize when our monkey guard coming. So they try to give, still feed the monkey when there is no person there. So it's like a kind of tricky with the, with the people actually. And then a few taking pictures, not a lot, and we didn't hear any aggressive, uh, aggressive interaction between the monkey in Maura Angke and, uh, and the people and sightseeing. It's mostly happening and it now increased again. And the favorite visiting time is at 2 p.m. until 6 p.m. We try also collecting data in the morning, but the morning seems to be people rush in a rush to maybe work or, or school or something else, so not many, and mostly in the weekend. And as you can see on the right, is uh, the, the green dot is the, where the potential conflicts happen. Next. Dr. Pramuswari, you have one more minute. <laughs> okay, there is a mitigation effort. We have uh, connected with the government. We connected with the people, uh, with the resident and also the developer. Next. And also we identify people who give a food. Actually, the macaques will come when the people is coming. So if it's not, they will just stay inside. They will eat the pidada, api-api, or nipah. And also the monkey guard, he also asked the security to get involved. Next. Next. <laughs> oh, it take a while. Uh, so, but the waktu, yeah, but ding. We also did uh, like uh, education with the local community there. Uh, we did a webinar about the Muara Angke in general. We talking about the biodiversity, we're talking about the mangrove rehabilitation and also the macaques. And we try as well for put the sign about because of mostly about not give a food to the macaques, 
that's why the profession is down but the other activity is not so maybe we need a better wording for the campaign and also we try a, a, a rubbish bin trying improve the rubbish bin and the newest is the developers start to put a CCTV so they know if there is any, tra any traffic jam because of the macaques the security will come and then let people okay just go go not can uh, stop in that road next and I think the last one ding, ding. yeah I already talked about it next one there is actually the conclusion is based on the capital city uh, also one help it, we already talked about it many many times interact more interaction means more possibility to get uh, interaction with, with any kind of uh, pathogens next and for the conclusion is there is no single solution for human macaques conflict especially in urban area because you have to deal with the animals and the people and the people is like a really diverse and please engage with the multi-stakeholder and local communities we can't work alone and in, since morning we talk about survey is important monitoring also important and also we are really open for any collaboration research for students to work with the human macaques conflict in Indonesia. Thank you so much for your time to listening to us. I'm so sorry with the, some technical issue. Thank you, Dr. Promiswari, for the nice talk. Uh, so the strategies of navigation, uh, it's uh, important and it need to be done. Okay, for the next speaker, we will invite Prof. Yan Ho from uh, University of Copenhagen. I think Prof. Yan Ho already joined with us. Prof. Yes, Yan Ho, are yeah, you thank, thank, oh, thank you very hey. much. How are you, Prof. Yan Ho? <laughs> I, I am here. I hope you can hear me. Hello? Maybe. Yes, maybe we can you hear can... you. Uh, okay. okay. Thank uh, you. Prof. Yan Ho uh, is from. Okay, okay, Prof. Yan Ho, uh, I will introduce you for the uh, participants. So, Prof. Yan Ho from uh, University of uh, Copenhagen, and uh, today, uh, Prof. Yan Ho will uh, deliver his talk regarding lesson learned from Copenhagen University, the potential use of uh, macaque fasciculars in biology and biomedical research. Prof. Yan Ho, you have 20 minutes uh, to present your uh, talk, and the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Then, <clears throat> then I will be uh, I will be quick. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes, we can see your hey. screen. And then, hey. please put oh, in thank, thank the slideshow. Very, thank you very, okay. Thank you very much for inviting me to this very very interesting uh, conference. And uh, I am delighted to uh, to talk about. <clears throat> the importance of Cynomalgus monkeys in biomedical research. Um, it, it is um, obviously clear that, that there is an increasing demand for uh, research uh, and, and the use of Cynomalgus monkeys in research in areas like preclinical pre trials. COVID has created an increase and certainly also the development of RNA drugs and vaccines. There are a number of, uh, of ethical issues that I know that you are fully aware of when you use uh, non-human primates in biomedical research because of their closeness to us and the fact that they are not domesticated like mice and rats and cats and dogs that we have lived with for many, many generations in captivity, which means that when you use non-human primates, you require really, really competent staff and really expensive uh, uh, facilities. The traditional monkey in biomedical research uh, has always been the rhesus monkey, uh, <clears throat> but the increasing popularity of Cynomalgus monkeys or the long-tailed macaque, which is another name for it, is spectacular. And in recent years, it seems like it is now far more popular than the rhesus monkey. 
But there are also other species that I would just mention a little bit about because these are uh, these share also uh, many uh, similarities with the uh, issues we have with uh, interaction with humans and human conflicts and mitigation procedures. Uh, and those are two uh, African species. One is the African green monkey, which you see here, which is a little smaller than the uh, rhesus monkey. And <clears throat> another one is the baboon, which is a very large and very strong and powerful non-human primate. Both of these species are also used extensively in, in biomedical uh, research. And as you know, there is severe criticism uh, of, uh, of the use of non-human primates in biomedical research. And I will tell you that my personal experience is that they remain necessary. Non-human primates are really essential in biomedicine simply because of their closeness, their similarity to humans. That means that we still have a need to use these animals in, in research, but it is obviously important that it is done under the best possible circumstances and that these animals are not subjected to stress and pain. And there are a number of challenges I started my research on uh, using non-human primates almost 50 years ago at the University of Odense in Denmark, where I used uh, African green monkeys simply because the proteins that I was working with, they were too different in mice and rats uh, to be able to determine analogies to the human. So we had to use non-human primates to find out which animals were analogous to each other so that we could study the relevant proteins in both man and animal. Stress is a real problem when you work with non-human primates for many different reasons. And uh, we have always been concerned with how to make sure that the animals we use are not stressed and give them the best possible living conditions. And we have done that by developing uh, biomarker uh, analysis in uh, secretions like saliva and urine and feces, simply to be able to determine the stress level from a distance and without interfering with the animals. And I have done that at, uh, at the different universities that I have worked with, where I have been in charge of the animal facilities. Here's an example of uh, animals in a Swedish facility where we had a farm and where we uh, did a number of studies to uh, increase the, the uh, quality of the cages for the monkeys. And you can see here that even though the animals obviously could walk inside, and also outside, they preferred to be outside, even when temperatures dropped and it was really, really cold. We also uh, studied here in, in combination with this, we developed methods where we, where we uh, tried to calculate exactly how to do behavioral observations so that these are robust and reliable. Because when you make time budgets for animals and you want to know how much time they spend on different behaviors, it's very important that you collect sufficient data, but there's no point in collecting too many data. And you can actually, you can preset this so you know that you get reliable time budgets. Uh, when I moved to Copenhagen, uh, almost 20 years ago uh, to the Copenhagen uh, facilities, we still had a few monkeys left, but we retired them. And it turned out that, that these old monkeys that were moved from the university to a uh, local zoological garden, they got a much more naturalistic environment and they showed behaviors that are very typical of, of this species that they had not been able to show for many, many years when they lived in smaller enclosures inside the university. My experience is that small colonies of non-human primates in university settings are not ideal 
because they are very expensive to establish and staff and operate. And <clears throat> this means that you really, really should try to concentrate these activities in expert centers. One of the reasons for this is also that then you eliminate transport of the animals, which could be very stressful for the animals. So I have for many, many years, I have collaborated with expert primate centers in, uh, in the US and in Europe, where we have a number of, of primate centers organized by the EU and the Institute of Primate Research in Nairobi and Kenya. And of course, your local uh, institute, uh, which is operated by Dr. Huda Darisman. In, in collaboration with the Indonesian Primate Center, we have also looked at stress. And I mentioned that transport stress is an, an issue. And we looked at transportation and compared transporting the animals in pairs instead of individually. And here you can see we compared the time budgets for animals transported singly and animals transported with a companion, a friendly travel companion. And if you look up at, at, the, uh, at the left corner, you will see the red behavior where the animals interact peacefully with each other. And that is, of course, very, very difficult if you're not traveling with a companion. We also looked at aggression after transportation, aggression towards humans, which is a typical sign of stress in Cynomolgus monkeys. And we could see that they were less stressed when they had been traveling together with a companion compared to when they have been traveling alone. Uh, I have worked a lot in, in collaboration, as I said, with expert colleagues in, uh, in primate centers and looked at, at, uh, at different uh, biomedical uh, uh, problems, but certainly also uh, worked with how to improve the conditions for the animals. The species that we work with, they are very, very common. And uh, as you know, they are considered an agricultural pest and they are subjected to programs aimed at reducing the populations. And we heard the interesting presentation previously by, by Dr. Wendy, who talked about all these uh, uh, mitigation initiatives. Unfortunately, it's still very common that animals are culled, that they are subjected to, to government-operated uh, eradication programs in certain areas. And it's very, very difficult because the wild world is disappearing as we know it. We are too many people and there's not enough space for animals. So I have also worked a lot with how to deal with this problem in particular in East Africa. And we have looked at how to improve relocation programs. So moving animals um, away from people and into what is left of the wild nature. This is actually very difficult. It's a very laudable initiative, of course, and it, sh it should be pursued, but <clears throat> it is very, very difficult because the animals uh, are very, very stressed when they are captured and transported. We have, here's an example where we looked at, at transferring uh, uh, Sykes monkeys and <clears throat> and they are subjected to trapping, and some of them are darted with a dart gun, and then they are kept in, in holding cages, and then they are transported, and then again they are kept in cages before they are released. So unfortunately, this activity is associated with a high morbidity and mortality, and improvements are much needed, and we have tried to develop these. We have also looked very detail, we have looked at, at stress in the African green monkey because uh, we found that this species, which is very common in East Africa, is actually very susceptible to stress. So we looked at mortality and morbidity and weight loss and stomach ulcers, and we found that they exhibited all the classical symptoms of severe stress uh, when they had just been captured and now were confined to a cage. And it actually turned out that they take at least half a year 
to acclimatize to new conditions. And these are new conditions. This is when in, in the primate center in Nairobi in Kenya, where they have big breeding cages for African green monkeys and baboons. Baboons are a little different. They are hardy and they are very robust. But uh, we it, so for this species, we have worked extensively uh, with improving the models and uh, refining the models when these are used to study human infections. They are incredibly important when we study human infections, particularly tropical infections, because they share so they have so many similarities with people and they live under the same conditions and and very often drink the same water as the local population does. So uh, it's very important to, uh, to, to improve the guidelines for how these infection studies are carried out. And right now we are, we are engaged in looking at, at baboons infected with more than one infection, because unfortunately it's very, very common <clears throat> for human patients in Africa to be infected with more than one uh, tropical infection. And many, many patients are infected with both malaria and schistosomiasis. But back to the Sinos, the, the uh, Sinomulgus monkey, the long-tailed macaque, uh, here we collaborate uh, intimately with uh, Dr. Huda's uh, primate center. And uh, here's an example <coughs> of the research <laughs> where uh, Dr. Huda found that uh, Cynomulgus monkeys, the long-tailed macaque, is an excellent spontaneous model for human dementia because these animals, they develop, some of them develop dementia, which is very, very similar to dementia in the human being. And this he has published in a number of very interesting publications. And of course, Cynomulgus monkey is also stressed. We talked about transport stress, but it seems our studies seem to indicate that the uh, long-tailed macaque is less susceptible to stress than for instance, the African green monkey. And we have looked at, at stress markers in, uh, in Cynomulgus monkeys, and, and we have found that they seem to be fairly resilient to uh, stress, which is of course good news because that means that they thrive better in captivity than, than many other non-human primate species. So I would say my personal views and my personal conclusions is that biomedical uh, non-human primate research really belongs in centers of excellence where people know what they're doing, where you have sustainable breeding colonies and expert staff. I think that, that ideally these centers, they should be developed in, in source countries where the animals are, are, are present naturally, minimizing transportation and also making it easier to provide them with good outdoors facilities in the climate that the animals are used to so that they don't walk around in the snow up in Sweden. Um, I think the steady uh, increase in popularity of, of long-tailed macaques is justified because it adapts really, really well to captivity and it responds very well to interaction with people and to positive reinforcement training. And I think that if we continue uh, on this avenue of establishing large primate centers in source countries, then we will minimize and, and with time eliminate the need to capture feral or wild animals for captive breeding programs of non-human primates. So finally, I would like to thank some of my many collaborators, in particular, uh, Dr. Steve that I have worked with for many, many years, but also a great number of postgraduate students that have been through my laboratory uh, and, and worked extensively with uh, non-human primates for many, many years and all have done a phenomenal job. So finally, thank you very much for uh, listening to my talk, both in 
both in Indonesia and the many people online. So thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Jan Hor, for the presentation. So we will have a discussion in the session. And we would like to invite Dr. Marlon Fritz Hansen as well to join with us in this discussion. So doc, I think Dr. Marlon already joined. Okay, yeah. So we will happy to pick the question from uh, the audience uh, for uh, three speakers and four speakers actually. So any question for the speakers? Prof. Yanho, could you uh, stop share first and then so we can continue for the discussion? I'll stop sharing. Hang on. Yeah, sorry. Stop sharing. I hope it works. Okay, okay thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Malin, to join with us for this discussion. So, any question for the speakers? So, we have uh, one question. Okay. Yeah, in the session, we have the invited speaker with uh, the nice, uh, yeah, the, with the interesting topic. So, oh, the question for Dr. Malin. So, uh, from Rigwood, Citizen Science. Yeah, and what are some strategies for improving? Okay, wonderful public education about uh, long term macaques and co assistance with the people. Okay, Dr. Melin. Thank you very much. Would you answer the question directly? Can you yeah. Hear me? Yes, okay, sure. Great. Thank you. Yeah, we can hear Perfect. you. Perfect. Really. Yeah, as you just uh, mentioned as well, um, anyone can contact me on my email if you have any other questions. And hi, Rick. Uh, thank you for this question. Um, there are a lot of strategies, and we're actually right now uh, collecting a lot of different information from different countries in terms of how to coexist with long-tailed macaques and well other primate species for that matter as well and i think that what i think there are two things that we need to just initially think of so in terms of our wording i've heard many people today and i used it myself as well we use the word conflict constantly and the problem is that when we use such loaded words, negatively loaded words, then it actually seems to sometimes increase conflicts because then people start thinking, oh, was it a conflict? Oh, it's a conflict. Um, but it might not have been in the beginning if we hadn't used that word. So I think to improve coexistence, we also need to consider our wording and we need to really investigate and think about what is the word conflict and was there really a conflict and how do people perceive those words and um, for example we could use negative interactions or we could simply talk about interfaces as i also said in my talk interfaces contain everything it's not peaceful coexistence so coexistence is also about you know the negative interactions the positive interactions and the neutral interactions and we've actually seen that a lot of neutral interactions are um, perceived as conflict for some so for example just a macaque crossing a road can be a conflict for some people so again then we need to kind of look into it and see is it really a conflict and what is a conflict so i think that's important for all of us when we work uh, in these interfaces, that we use uh, correct wording, that we understand what is said, and that we really talk a lot about it and also um, contact people a lot more, get to the bottom of this, do participant follows, you know, improve our ethnography to understand people better in these interfaces. And then one other thing is uh, to listen. A lot of us will go straight in and just start mitigating and start thinking, okay, what can we do to improve this interface? 
But a lot of time needs to be spent just spending time with the people in these interfaces, listening to them, listening to what they have to say, because often a lot of them don't feel heard. So if we just spend time and we listen and we take in what they're feeling, how they're feeling in these interfaces, for example, if they're feeling afraid, we need to listen and to help comfort them and also help them understand the behavior of the macaques to help lessen that fear. So I think ethnography, using that in these interfaces to understand people better and to work with people in how to coexist with the macaques would be a great improvement for all of us. And also thinking a lot about the words we use and how those words affect people. And, and then again, what we do, for example, in the Long Sound Macaque Project is that we try to look at all the positive interactions and all the positive things and behaviors of the Long Sound Macaque. So really promoting all of the cultural behaviors, for example, that JB Leica told about, uh, talked to you about. And also Lydia Lunch has done a lot of great work on this. Michael Gummer, Suchinda Malavijitnand. You know, there's a lot of people that have worked on and looked into these cultural behaviors. So presenting them more, talking about the adaptability, flexibility, all of the great behaviors of the long-tail macaque to help us understand the species better instead of only talking about the negativity. So I think people need to hear the positive things a lot more and that will also help change the way we perceive these interfaces and show them in the wild, show them what they're good at. If you look behind me, you'll see some of my research subjects and they're out foraging in the shallow waters, uh, eating seagrass. And I think that's important to show as well, instead of them only sitting in uh, garbage <laughs> bins, which they do as well. And that's also part of their behaviors. So that's also okay, but yeah. I think there's a, a lot of rephrasing that needs to be done to increase coexistence. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Malen, for the explanation regarding this. And more questions for the audience? Okay. Uh, for Dr. Wendy? Okay. <laughs> yeah, please. Okay, thank you, Mel Melanie. Yeah, thank you, Melanie, for the question about uh, most of the guys concerned with decreasing and then trying to increase. No, it's one of the strategy actually, not the conflict goal. It's one of the strategy. So, for example, in the city with the big city, for example, with the city and the fragmented area, when more uh, population there, the the interaction or interface between macaques and human are higher. So they try to uh, reduce the interaction. That's why the sterilization is not the goal, but it's one of the strategy. I think that's the answer. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Wendy Pramiswari, uh, for answering uh, the question. So, uh, because uh, time uh, is limited and also we have the tight schedule, so uh, we are reaching at the end of uh, this discussion. And uh, thank you uh, for uh, all the speakers and also uh, for the active discussion uh, from the audience. And uh, if uh, you have uh, any question for the, uh, in the future, so maybe you can send uh, in an email and then all the speaker will open the discussion for this. Okay, for, uh, for the next uh, agenda, I will be handed to Mbak Fitria. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Simi, for guiding the speech and discussion. And we will continue to the next agenda. As the end of uh, the speech session from invited speakers, we would like to give an appreciation for the speakers. So please welcome Pa Uus for giving the, cert the souvenir of appreciation for Dr. Huda and also for Dr. Wendy.
Okay, and the next one is for Pahuda. Okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, today's conference supported by Taman Safari Indonesia, the Primate Research Center, Nirwana Doninsa Yuti Foundations, and the media partner for today's conference is our Scorpion Indonesia Foundation, Jakarta Animal Aid Network, and International Animal Rescue Indonesia. The next agenda is oral presentations from offline and online presenter. And then all the presentation and discussion will be moderated by Dr. Uu Saifullo. So please welcome uh, Dr. Uu Saifullo from Private Research Center. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, we hope uh, that you are all still uh, interested to joining to join this uh, conference. Uh, thank you also, uh, Fitria, for your introduction. And uh, thank you. First uh, of all, I would like to thank to the committee who has given me an opportunity to be uh, a moderator for this oral presentation. Uh, right now, we have six uh, speaker, I think six honorable speaker that will present their uh, topic, their interesting topic. So uh, without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Dwi Atmoko Agung Nugroho. She's uh, uh, from the Primatology Study Program alumni, uh, graduate school, IPB University. Doctor. Uh, Greeting everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Duat Moko Agung Groho, but you can call me Groho. I was granted a doctoral degree in primatology major IPB University Bogor in 2021. My dissertation experiment at that time was about long time macaques as an unfairness model for humans. You can read the detail in the paper. The research question was quite simple. That was, do primates, including humans, really have a sense of fairness? This question arises due to the sense of fairness based on inequity apparition in postnatal experiment tends to happen only for disadvantaged one, while the advantaged one tend to ignore or didn't protest the inequity. You can see what really happened there in the YouTube video. We can see that the protest only came from the disadvantaged one, that was the left monkey, while the advantaged one, that was the right monkey, ignores or didn't care about the inequity condition. So, a sense of fairness based on inequity aversion was an unreliable thing. We predict the preference for the type of income determines the aversive behavior, such as throwing the income or even stealing the partner's income. Simply said that the more you prefer, the more you suffer. It is like we can see that the most favorite goods or the most favorite foods or the most favorite things, socially, always being the reason for fighting or ignoring. To test that prediction, we run a food preference test for six individual monkeys and an aversion test with ratio one by one, zero by two, and one by three in six pairs of monkeys. The results show us that hard for these macaques to accept equity distribution, even though we didn't use the deprivation technique as a prep experimental condition.
we found that even 80% of monkeys were averse to equity condition one by one of the most preferred foods such as red grapes. And that result did not differ significantly with an aversion to equity condition euro by two or one by three. This means that being averse to inequity didn't equal accepting equity itself. But interestingly, we found that aversion in zero by two were lower rather than in one by three, which means that getting no at all was even better rather than getting a little number in equity condition. This result were quite valid to conclude that generally primates have not programmed to have a sense of fairness and long-tail macaques were a good model for unfairness in humans. Thank you for your attention. If you have any question, please feel free for asking to me through email mokonugroho28 at gmail.com. I would thank my supervisor, Professor Dodin Sajuti, Professor Sisukraptini, Dr. Entang, and Dr. Huda. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Dwi Atmoko for your interesting uh, presentation. So uh, the question uh, will be in the end of the session. So next speaker is uh, Dr. Saleh Bansal Mayer from University of Lethbridge, Canada. Dr. Bansal Mayer, uh, you have 10 minutes for, your presentation, for uh, the presentation. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Caleb Bonsmeyer, and in this presentation, I will discuss a seemingly playful form of object manipulation performed by free-ranging Balinese long-tailed macaques. This behavior that we are calling the bottle game involves the combinatory manipulation of two different artifacts and is unique in the way that it may combine the material culture of human and non-human primates. The bottle game requires the use of two artifacts. The first consists of a small object, such as a stone or nut, that can then be placed into the second, which functions as a container and typically consists of empty plastic water bottles, hence our name, the bottle game. The basic sequence of a bottle game bout consists of three parts. First, the object is inserted, then it is typically followed by a period of time in which the object is held inside the container and out of the macaque's reach. Finally, the object is either retrieved from within the container using a part of the body or released by reorienting the container and allowing the object to exit through the container's opening. The bottle game has been observed in two separate populations of Balinese long-tailed macaques, and in each population, it has been observed being performed by juvenile, subadult, and adult male and female macaques. The objective of our research into the bottle game hopes to answer the why of this behavior, or what motivates individuals to perform the bottle game, and what are the variables that keep the individual engaged. To do so, we will analyze the affordances of the objects used, sequence of actions in a bottle game bout, the context in which it is performed, possible inner and intrapopulation differences in its expression. The first step of the bottle game is the insertion. There are three main methods of insertion that have been identified. First, the object is inserted using the mouth, and in this case, it is held in the mouth and then brought to the opening of the container and inserted using the tongue or lips. Second, the object is inserted using the fingers, which requires the macaque to hold the object in a precision grip primarily with the fingertips and placed with little forcefulness through the container's opening. Third, the object is held in a power grip and placed through the opening with force applied to the object by the palm of the hand, where the whole hand is brought up to the wrist through the opening while gripping the object. These methods are not entirely mutually exclusive. Sometimes the macaque may use a combination of insertion methods such as in this last image where the macaque attempts to insert a stone into the bottle using both hands and then using the mouth. After the insertion, it is held or retained inside of the container. Depending on the size and shape of the container, this means that the object is kept out of the macaque's reach. And at this point, the macaque may do a number of actions, such as biting the retained object and container, shaking the container like a rattle, or looking through the container's opening at the object inside. Similarly to inserting the object, there are a few methods the macaque will use to regain control of the object. The macaque may insert the hand or one or more fingers through the container's opening to retrieve the object or reorient the container so that the object freely exits through the opening and sometimes using the mouth to catch the object. Each object and container combination is different between bottle game bouts 
and the differences between these result in variation in how the bottle game is executed. The material can range from glass to plastic, creating different sounds when the object is inserted. The object or the container can be translucent or opaque, which limits the macaque's ability to visually track the object inside the container. The containers can differ in size and shape, which limits the macaque's ability to physically access the object while it is retained. And as the containers are typically forged materials that have been discarded by humans, the structural integrity of the container might be open or flattened, limiting the movement of the retained object. And the container is not exclusive to bottles or other easily manipulated artifacts. Sometimes the bottle game sequence of inserting an object, retrieving it, again, is performed on fixed parts of the macaque's environments, such as metal or PVC pipes, or even tree stumps with hollow openings. Another variable that may influence the performer's motivation to engage in the bottle game is the number of openings that the container has. And in this first example, we see a subadult male macaque who is using a piece of PVC piping and a small bead. The container here has two relatively small openings that require precision on the macaque's part to insert the object and is opaque. Upon insertion, the object can fall out of the bottom of the pipe and roll away unless the second opening is oriented against the substrate, keeping it retained. And in the second example, a juvenile male is using a small stone in a plastic bottle. The bottle, while still intact structurally, allowing the object to move inside, has a second opening along its side. This open opening randomizes the outcome of an insertion depending on how the container is oriented, so the subject here doesn't necessarily know where the object will go after an insertion. It could be held in the container waiting to be released again, or it could immediately fall out and roll away. As with the containers, there are a range of object types that can affect the execution of the bottle game. The objects can be divided into two categories, inedible objects such as stones or beads and even coins, or edible objects such as redracts and nuts or fruit pits. The objects range in size and shape. Too large of an object can be inserted through container openings or may increase the difficulty the macaque has in retrieving it. And in some cases, more than one object is used. In the example on the right, the macaque is attempting to insert three mud-covered redracts and nuts at the same time and through an opening barely larger than the nuts themselves, requiring an increase in precision on the macaque's part. And as mentioned before, the bottle game has been observed in two populations of free-ranging long-tailed macaques living within and around temple areas, specifically at the Uluwatu Temple and Uluwatu in southern Bali and the Sacred Monkey Forest in Abud in central Bali. The presence of macaques in these two locations have been incorporated into the substantial tourism industry of the island. As such, they are given daily food provisions and have become habituated to the presence of humans. The popularity of these two locations as tourist destinations has resulted in a large amount of human trash, giving the macaques an abundance of discarded objects to explore and in the case of the bottle game, as previously mentioned, the objects and containers of varying size, shape, and material. Previous research conducted at both of these sites has examined other object-directed and culturally transmitted behaviors that are performed throughout the macaque's lifespan. At the sacred monkey forest in Abud, macaques routinely engage in stone handling. Stone handling involves the non-instrumental manipulation of stones, and the Balinese long-tailed macaques at the Sacred Monkey Forest have shown an extensive repertoire of 36 different stone handling patterns. Stone handling has been observed in three other closely related macaque species, namely Japanese, rhesus, and Taiwanese macaques. Like the bottle game, this is another behavior that appears to be playfully motivated, and often occurs before or after a bottle game bout and stone handling patterns are often directed towards the object container when performed by this population of macaques. In Uluwatu, the macaques are known to spontaneously engage in robbing and bartering. These macaques have learned through social mechanisms to steal objects such as glasses, phones, and hats from visitors to the temple. 
These objects are then used as tokens, which can be exchanged with humans for a food reward of varying quality and value. Research has shown that this phenomenon requires economic strategizing from the mechanic, uh, as more experienced uh, drivers uh, and uh, uh, preferentially uh, select uh, tokens uh, such uh, as uh, phones and glasses that will result in higher uh, value uh, rewards uh, during the bartering process. And so, by identifying and analyzing the behavioral patterns of bottle game bout, the affordances of the objects, and the context in which they are performed, we hope to find why the bottle game may be intrinsically rewarding for the macaques, how this might differ for different macaques, and gain insight into the emergence of this behavior in two different populations. Thank you. He, uh, he will present their uh, topic uh, directly from this room. Dr. Uh, Dr. Burla, please. 10 minutes, your time. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I hope you guys still have the spirit to finish this uh, conference day. Um, interestingly, uh, the conference today is, uh, you know, it's part of technology now. We all have this conference hybridly. And um, speaking about the technology, I would like to talk about technology in uh, assessing, assessing the welfare behavior. So yeah, I'm trying to give a talk about applied digital tools for uh, behavior assessment in a long-term macaque rehabilitation facility as a comparative uh, case study. Next, yes, this is the reason why we all gather here uh, online or maybe offline. Of course, next. Hmm? Yeah, um, habitat loss and then uh, we live overlap with the macaques and then it's become a negative uh, interaction so it's become another justification to use them as anything, like catch them and then separate them from their mother and then sell it as a pet, or maybe, you know, just force them to be a performer, or maybe keep them as a wild uh, as a pet, and then when they get bigger, we just get bored and then just abandon in the house just like that, and most of the time it's uh, ending in uh, poor conditions such as you know suffering, injured, ill, or maybe some orphan. And then uh, not so many uh, institutions want to rescue and rehabilitate uh, macaque right now. We almost retired for this actually, but we still have uh, like a uh, scorpion and then also John. So this is just a small cases that we have, uh, we still can do. And uh, we, uh, we try to rescue and rehabilitate the macaque. Next. Yeah, and, and when we try to rehabilitate the macaque, means we have to fulfill to provide their animal welfare as long as they can, you know, uh, become normal again and ready to be released again to the wild. And uh, there's uh, one part of the welfare, which is the natural behavior. We can assess that by uh, uh, behavior observation and then traditionally can done with the pen and paper. And we did also some study about that in the, uh, in the last years, but now everything is, you know, so jiki technology is improving. We have this kind of uh, digital tools to help this kind of uh, behavior observation as a tool to uh, assess the welfare. And next, please. In the last two years, uh, we improved uh, this technology called Zoo Monitor. It was designed and developed by Lincoln Park Zoo and Zia Nilman Consulting since 2014. This actually uh, just a tool to create an, uh, any project for a behavior observation. And then once it is already created and pro uh, the project is already created, it just, you know, just do the observation through our uh, gadgets such as like tablet or maybe phone. 
directly and then uh, we record the behavior and then analyze as a general uh, report and then sometimes we can also export the data for further analysis and uh, this is become the objective for our study actually next please which is to test the efficiency the reliability and the validity of the zoom monitor as tool for behavioral observation in our uh, rehab macaques and then next next please okay for the method uh, we have like uh, seven individuals it, it was like in a uh, uh, I think last or uh, in the last two or one years ago, this is uh, the the last uh, population small group that we had since we almost retired for doing this rescue and rehabilitation center. Um, then um, uh, there are two groups, three males and four females. We try to do uh, observation behavior, uh, behavior observation using the scan sampling with one minute interval. We try to compare uh, with the traditional one with the pen and paper, and then. Also, the zoom monitor, and then we try to compare the result with the multivariate GLM. And then next for the result, oh no, no sorry, this is the ethogram. Sorry, this is the ethogram. You know, it's just a couple of behavior that we record. And then next, this is the tally sheet for doing the pen and paper behavior observation. And then next. This is how uh, we did uh, with the zoom monitor, you know, it's just uh, tablets and then animals and then we can just uh, take the behavior and then next This is the the interface of the zoom monitor itself when we doing the project and then when we record the behavior Okay, and then next This is the result we did this around six months of uh, study we gain around uh, 10,000 of uh, data points, and we focus on five uh, most uh, behavior that recorded, which is traveling, eating, vigilance, foraging, and social. At the moment, uh, we feel like uh, there's a you know effort and time that ha we have to do when we're doing the the manual to input again the data to to analyze. But with the zoom monitor, we can easily just transfer it. You know, it's just export the data. And then next, for the statistic work, uh, we try to compare uh, the result. And overall, actually, there are uh, significant differences between uh, two methods. But when we did it, uh, the individual behavior one by one, we can see like uh, the travel and vigilance is uh, significantly different. But the other three is were not significantly different. And then next, as conclusion, uh, in this case, uh, Zoom Monitor is proved to be much more effective and efficient. And then uh, it has potential also to assessing behavior in much larger and long-term survey for the mock-up behavior. And uh, while we see the test revealed that there are some differences between methods, but however, it's just probably because of uh, the external factors that we're not controlled, such as the time difference and environmental difference. As some behavior actually, uh, like social forage and feeds, show no significant difference. And then uh, suggest that we need to do repeat study to conduct that, to reduce the influence of the external factors. But anyway, next. Whether it's it's uh, it's uh, an insignificant un difference, but we found also some advantages that we can do to improve uh, the welfare of our animals, such as it's paperless, it's customizable. We can do this in any kind of animal. Actually, uh, we've been trying in any kind of uh, primate that we had, like uh, orangutan, siamang, slow loris, and then macaques also. It's multifunction. We don't have to do with other tools, just uh, the cell phone, and then we don't need timekeepers. Portable, it just, you know, we can bring anywhere. And then it's also had a precise data collections. And that's it at the end of my presentation. Thank you. I would like to say thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. I would like to say thank you for my uh, super team. Without them, this study is nothing. And then we also want to say uh, uh, 
condolence one of our uh, member already gone in the, in the beginning of the year so it's such a hard uh, moment for us but anyway we still try to uh, make the welfare for animal better and better again thank you these are the reference thank you very much dr purba for your interesting presentation uh, the next presenter is Muhammad Fajrul Ripki from University of 11 Maret, Surakarta. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hello. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to give to me. First of all, let me introduce myself. I am Muhammad Pajur Rifki from Department of Forest Management, Faculty of Agriculture, 11 Maret University. In this opportunity, I would like to present about distribution of long tailed macaque, macaque vascularis, in Delhi Island, Pandeglang, Banten. Okay, uh, introduction. Long tailed macaque, uh, macaque vascularis, are primates that are often found in various regions in Indonesia. Sayuti at uh, 2016 explained that uh, the long tailed macaque are spread in tropical area Indonesia from Sumatra, Kalimantan, Java, and the Lesser Sunda Island to Timor. The existence of long tailed macaque is easy to find in various living uh, ecosystem, including Daily Island, which is geographically outside of its natural distribution or introduction. One of the important information in the management of long tailed macaque habitat on Delhi Island is distribution data. Information regarding uh, the distribution of long tailed macaques, macaque vascularis on Delhi Island has not been found. Uh, this uh, study is needed to determine the distribution of long tailed macaque on Delhi Island as an effort to support habitat management on Delhi Island. It's hope uh, that the data on distribution of long tailed macaque on Delhi Island will serve uh, basic data for further studies. Methods the study was conducted on Delhi Island, which is administratively uh, located in Chikuru Wetan Village, Chikasi, Pandeglang, Banten. This research was conducted from June to July 2022. The tools used in this study include the GPS binocular, compass, watch, camera, tally sheet, uh, a set of computer and art map G software. Uh, the material used in this study include a map of Delhi Island area and literature on long tailed macaque. Procedure and data analysis. Data on the distribution of long tailed macaque were obtained using the transit method, a straight line that intersects the width of the island, the path is determined based on preliminary studies of potential encounter with long tailed macaque. The distribution studied was analysis descriptively, quantitatively, and the distribution of long tailed macaque was analysis using uh, RMAPG software. Descriptive analysis is a description to explain of the distribution of the macaque group studied uh, to determine the distribution pattern using the average nearest neighbor analysis. Result and discussion. The survey location is divided into six observation lines that the evenly distribution across the island from north to south. Overall, uh, there were 119 uh, counterpoints with group of long tailed macaque that are collected from a uh, survey from June to July 2022. The contents of group of long tailed macaque were identified based on the composition of the group structure, the direction of group movement, and the study of long tailed macaque ranks with the same habitat, which was observed from its encounter of long tailed macaque. Group identified was scared of the facility in the process of deepening the distribution analysis and distribution of pattern of the long tailed macaque group. The result of the group analysis of the were 70, uh, 27 group of long tailed macaque scattered on Delhi Island. The group analysis referred to uh, the home range on long tailed macaque in Joseph Research uh, 20, 
when 2010 stating the the estimate average area of the long term maka group on Tinjil Island is a uh, 6.9 hectare. The habitat condition of Dili Island and Tinjil Island have similar thus the vegetation condition is relatively the same, namely coastal uh, vegetation in the form of all three such as ketapang along the north side and the south coast vegetation dominated by pandanus, Holmes and Van Balen, uh, 1996. Based on the result of the field survey, long term macaque are often found on transit 2, transit 4, and several encounters on the north coast. Long term macaque are often found in this location because there are several forest trees. Yerina et al. 2015 explained the, the availability of natural food plant species is one of the reasons why occupy these habitats. Pine et al. 2000 in Sulistia di 2016 mentioned that long term macaque are often found in coastal forest, mangrove forest, and coastal forest to find food in the form of fruit, insect, uh, from eggs, crabs, and other coastal inter invertebrates. The vegetation from the location of the encounter is dominated by vegetation that produce fruit, <coughs> including ketapang, uh, pala, loa, butun, uh, jambu kelampo, waru, and kiara. The existence of the water source is a distribution factor order than food. Than food. Uh, this is according with Sembiring et al. 2012 in US et al. 2019 said the distribution of long term macaque is influenced by the presence of water source and food source. Fresh water source are found in swamps in the middle of Delhi Island. Several Scott and Wilson 1980 uh, in Fuden 1995 in January et al. 2009 meant that long term macaque were found in various environments with the greatest support is swamp forest and secondary forest. About the result of the analysis of this pattern of long tat macaques on Delhi Island showed a random pattern with a nearest neck ratio of 1.089431. The availability of food is often the cause of gathering of individual is one place, according to Fuentes et al. 2000. And seven uh, in Fakri et al. 2012, long term maka can adapt to virus condition, especially in habitat that uh, are affected by human activities. The random distribution pattern indicates the non selective behavior of the species towards its environment. Tarumingkem uh, to 19. 94 Sinaga et al. 2017. The concentration of long term macaque in this particular area indicates their avid preference. Okay, there are conclusion. There are uh, 27 group of long term macaques, macaque vascularis in Delhi Island. Distribution pattern of long term macaque group identified by random with a uh, nearest neck ratio of 1.08. 9431. The distribution of long tat macaque is often found in north coastal forest habitats and forests around swamps. Uh, okay, a uh, big thank you to the National Research and Innovation Agency of the Republic of Indonesia, survey team Mrs. Yuli Satya Fitriana, Mr. Yu Kurtiski Kurnia Tohir, Mr. Muhajir Hasibuan. Area Mulia Lupis who helped in data collection, CV Lapsindo, from Perhutani Banten, PKPH Malimping, for research permits. Okay, thank you. Uh, wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fajrul, for your uh, presentation. The next presenter is Dr. Tang <coughs> Iskandar. The topic is almost the same but different island. Uh, Dr. Ntang will uh, talk about the population uh, estimate and habitat analysis of uh, Makaka Kularis on Tinji Island. So, Dr. Ntang, please, the room is yours.
committee. Today, we would like to share our current research on population estimate and habitat analysis of the long-tail macaques on Dinjil Island. This is the team member of the research. Let me introduce a little bit about Tinjil Island. So, Tinjil Island is a small island located at the south coast of Java, more or less 16 kilometers from the south part of Java, namely Muara uh, Binu Angen. This is the uh, map of Tinjil Islands. So, basically, Tinjil Island is six kilometer length and one kilometer uh, width. To make easier, in monitoring and uh, controlling population. So there are 12 transects on the islands. The transect runs from north to south, three transects runs from east to west. All the transects has a name of the people who has contributed to the island. As you may know, conservation status of long tail macaque is currently listed as endangered species at the IUCN Red List. In the beginning, there was no monkeys on the islands. Mm -hmm. So starting in 1988, Primate Research Center of IPB has introduced mm -hmm. some of breeder uh, to the islands. Between 1988 to 2007, a total of 603 breeders have been introduced onto Tinjil Island. This is the pictures of uh, activity of long tail macaques. So that there are three kinds of uh, different uh, long tail macaques on the islands. First one is the monkeys who already habituated to human. Second one, semi habitat habituated to, to uh, the human. And the third one, still uh, wild it's not habituated to the human. Since the beginning of the operation in 1997, 1987 till now, a total of 3,256 progenies have been uh, harvested from the islands. So our research is conducted to find out the current population status of the long-term macaques on the islands. And also, we do habit, habit, uh, habitat analysis of the long tail on the islands. So we use two longest transects, which is CD and ES for uh, doing population survey. So it's uh, on each transects, we repeat it six times. While uh, vegetation sampling, we, we made a, a vegetation sampling on KO, OS, RK, JK, SW, and the S transect, as you may see, and square, a uh, little square on the map. So the length of the ES, uh, ES transects is 6.37 kilometers, while on CD is 7.45 kilometers. So the results is. Um, we identified after 12 days uh, observations, we identified 16 groups on the islands, nine groups on ES transects, and seven groups on CD transects. These findings are slightly different, different from uh, what Kai has discovered. It's 18 to 20 uh, groups. This is how the groups distribute on the Tinjil. So we <clears throat> we consider two uh, two groups are different when the distance between two groups are uh, 300 meters. Number of group density you know, uh, on CD after you know six time repeated is 10.96, while on ES the number of group density is 10 to point, uh, 96 group uh, per kilometer square. While um, population density on ES are greater than uh, density on CD, which is 
compared to 66.67 uh, individuals per kilometer square. The average of group density uh, from the two transects are 13.46 groups per kilometer square, while the average population density is 111.05 individuals kilometer per kilometer square. So population estimate of the long tail macaque on the island is 627.38 individuals. If you compare our finding on group and population density to the uh, previous study, which is a long time ago, on the 2004, so the group density was higher than uh, than what Leeson discovered, 6.95, while our finding is 13.46 uh, groups per kilometer square. On population density, our findings is almost more than three times what uh, Lisa, Lisa discovered, which is 32 to 3.6 individuals <clears throat> per kilometer square. While our finding is 111.04 uh, individual per kilometer square. From habitat analysis, we identified 61 species and in 35 families. From those numbers, we found 23 species in 10 families are identified as food sources for the long tail macaques. So the most common plant family uh, we discover on the islands are Morase and Babase. The important value index from uh, level seedling and sapling are uh, dominated by Tessina elliptica, while on false level is dominated by Dolisandron spatisae with 59.28%, uh, while on three levels dominated by Hernandia feltata. We also discover other plants on the islands, Pandanus odorifer, Grenum asiaticum and Cocos nutspera. That's all our presentations. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mitak Iskandar for your uh, interesting uh, research. Then uh, the last but not the least speaker is Dr. Uh, Mary Ferdinandes. So I think uh, Dr. Uh, Mary, you have 10 minutes for your uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, good, every, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mary. I represent here in, from Jakarta Animal Aid Network Foundation, and I recently graduated from Primatology Master Major from IPV. I will present my presentation from one part of my study back then when I did my master at IPV and supervised by Dr. Huda and Dr. Entang. So, I would like to present about the animal welfare and confiscated uh, long-term macaques and what we are doing in the, our rehabilitation center in Jakarta Animal Aid Network. So this is one of the uh, main uh, confiscated or origins that we got we brought in and handed over to our center is from Dancing Monkey and this is one of the uh, investigation pictures uh, that took back then by the John de la Mala and East Java investigations and 
Uh, this is what uh, also the dancing monkey situations in Indonesia. Well, the background of the study of obviously of the relative large exploitations of the dancing monkey, uh, of sorry, of, of long tail macaques that been used uh, and been traded and by poaching traded and habitat declining and using as pet and the uh, dancing monkey and the, the conflict and so it's jeopardized the animal welfare principles and also there is a government words that by do the enforce the law enforcement and also doing the confiscation well the long term market confiscations handing over to rehab centers such as like from IAR and Scorpion and also within Jan we have uh, rehabilitation centers and by handing over in the rehabilitation centers, all the primates came to the quarantine uh, states or quarantine phase, uh, which is we have we will have three decisions uh, within in the quarantine phases. First is if they are the animals or the, the long term macaques are eligible to go to the rehabilitation process and then release. Or the quarantine, as uh, or the macaque will go to to the sanctuary, all are going to be euthanized because of the zoonosis, uh, disease and risk. So there's this animal welfare principles that, as all we know, that also implemented in in, in wildlife and also in the macaque. Macaca vascularis is there are five principles that also is there a good feeding, good health, good housing, uh, and appropriate behavior and mental state. So the purpose of the study uh, basically is to, to characterize to characterize the health status during the quarantine stage of this rehabilitation center to create a simple assessment for feasibility species specific macacapa squares and to have an overview and basically as the more the most important thing is the overview of the animal welfare conditions of from the initial rescue of the of all these confiscated uh macacapa squares so the research data collection was carried out together with the routine health checks up check up with three repetitions and two weeks within two weeks intervals and the animals were anesthetized under the general anesthesia and they were also have all this uh, physical health examinations including the, the body weight measurements the body condition score the physical examinations the tuberculosis uh, uh, check and test and the blood examinations and also the endoparasite examinations during this uh, quarantine stage. Yeah. And all uh, there know. are there were 30 macaca fasciculares that we are uh, examined where they are we divided into in into three groups which is first is dancing monkey groups and what? second one is the conflicts from the human wildlife conflicts we have five uh, and then also the expat monkey. So we analyze and we we do in the descriptive test uh, compression results from the scoring that we do from that we got from all the analysis, basic from the body weight, from the parameter that we measure from the body weight, body condition score, physical conditions, uh, blood and the parasites and tuberculosis. And then we, the results will group it into three categories from the origin of the of the Macaca fascicularis, which is dancing monkey groups, uh, expat monkeys, and also from the human wildlife conflict. So as we can see from the body weight, they were highest of uh, the body conditions. Uh, body weight uh, score is from the dancing monkey group and for, also the body condition score is from the dancing monkey group but they're based on the gender 
category the body weight is uh, highest from uh, the male group, but it's not significant in, in the body condition score. And for the physical parameter of physical conditions, uh, the human wildlife conflicts and pets have uh, become physically healthier than the dancing monkeys. And for from the blood examinations that we know that individuals from the conflict origins require observations compared to the individuals from the pet group where the presentation is healthy as much as 50% and monkey uh, dancing monkey as 85.71%. So this based on the examinations that we've been carried out, uh, we found that most of the dancing monkeys had their canals removed. And it's really badly uh, obstructed, and mostly all of the canines are extracted and were really bad obstructed compared to the expert uh, monkey dental conditions. But by uh, the result from the tuberculosis, all of them are status negative. But from the endoparasite status of dancing, based on the category of the agents, all individuals are not uh, endoparasite in general. The prevalence of element assist confiscated is was 20%, but uh, the uh, expat monkey and dancing monkey has the highest prevalence of the gastrointestinal uh, and parasites. So basic for the recommendations that we, we used and uh, adapted and modified from Kicknick and Becker and show it all. Uh, Okay, we use the we try to use a simple uh, facility feasibility assessment eligible uh, animal to go to the rehabilitation process in specific specific in a So we use the, the parameters and we go to the, the recommended score. So we have the recommendation score, we have the final score 23 and recommendation score for animals between 19 and 23. And if it's not eligible, we, we do it's, it's under 19. And based on the recommendation score, the average score based on the category is belonging in, in dancing monkey that is very eligible compared to the, uh, the, com the human wildlife conflict and and pets, expats, but they are all eligible to go to the rehabilitation uh, process. But uh, as we can, we if we are uh, evaluate from the health examinations that dancing monkey and and uh, dancing monkey and from this uh, expat monkey were have a poor. Uh, animal welfare conditions compared to the wildlife or uh, human wildlife conflict. So the recommendations of the study as, as there needs there is need additional assessment based on the behavior and it is necessary to study establishments and uh, for the law enforcement. So that's uh, my presentation. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Mary, for your presentation. So the next uh, session is the uh, question and answer. The committee provided about five to ten minutes for discussion. So any question? <coughs> so you could raise your hand uh, for your question uh, to uh, uh, ask the question directly to the speaker, or you could uh, write the question in the chat box. Okay, due to the limited uh, time, so I think uh, for this oral presentation, I would like to close this session, and for the next agenda, uh, I'd like to back it at the session to the uh, MC. Thank you very much for your presentation. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uus, for facilitating the oral presentation and bringing us to a very interesting uh, discussion with 
uh, the presenter, of course. And then now, before we reach the end of afternoon sessions, I invite uh, Dr. Inangah Budiyarsa, Budiyarsa, sorry, from Wanara Satwa Loka to give a short speech about long tail macaque from breeder perspective. Uh, please welcome uh, Dr. Inangah Budiyarsa. Terima kasih. Di sini, di sini. Ya, terima kasih. Selamat sore semuanya. Good afternoon, all participants of the seminar. So, first we say thank you for uh, uh, inviting me to attending this uh, international conference of Long Tail Macaque. So, my impression is uh, this uh, international conference of Long Tail Macaque. Makaka Pascularis is very interesting because this, uh, we, the community can put together from not only ethnic uh, and also broad and about, and we talk about uh, not only uh, maybe diseases or population and other conflict. So mm -hmm. I am is a business man of uh, non-human pyramid is one of the businessmen in Indonesia. So it's, uh, in future maybe we hope this seminar more, what we say, will help again, but we, uh, we talk more wide, more uh, data, especially maybe population of the non-human pyramid, especially uh, Makaka Pascularis in Indonesia. As we know from, from if not wrong, of Professor Stephen, and get picture that a lot of Makaka Pascularis was uh, import to United States, maybe almost 40,000, 39,000, just in one year. Indonesia is only less than 1,000, I think. As we know, in, uh, Indonesia is a lot of, uh, what we say, uh, non-human pyramid here. One of them is uh, Macapularis, and our director, Porisri, also said that fascicularis, Macapularis, is not protected animal in Indonesia. Even though in issue, I swear that fascicularis in English become a protected, so uh, actually uh, in Indonesia, I think Makaka is still love of animal from the Sumatra, Java, Bali, so I will see uh, Kalimantan, this lot. but maybe the data is uh, uh, data of population, maybe uh, need more what we say to do survey. and. Uh, Indonesia government also do survey for uh, this year uh, part of uh, province and and will do next year also uh, what to say uh, survey of Kusukulari so we can the government can uh, also decide how many people how many animal we can uh, use or to uh, use utilize for uh, export something because the population is still still a lot I think I think from our from the businessmen of a uh, uh, non human primate in Asia, Indonesia I think is um, uh, 1000 is uh, not uh, still small if we compare with the Cambodia Vietnam in the past yeah we hope the Primatology is, is a from program of primatology and maybe uh, let's say the primatology can do help uh, maybe research uh, and also uh, uh, census 
maybe help the government or uh, to get the data. I think that's my impression. This is a very good uh, seminar. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nanga, for the speech. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, at the end of today's conference, we would like to give an appreciation to our sponsor, Taman Safari Indonesia and Nirwana Donin Sayuti Foundations. So please welcome Pahuda for giving the certificate, the certificate of appreciation for both of our sponsors. For Nirwana Donin Sayuti Foundations, uh, it will be giving to uh, Dr. Nanga. So please come to. And the next certificate. Oh, okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have finally come to the end part of today's international conference on long-tailed macaques. Before I close these sessions, I would like to give to invite Dr. Huda Salahuddin Darusman, the head of Primatology Study Program, IPB University, to give us some short closing remarks. Please, Dr. Huda. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, participants in uh, inside the venue, yeah, uh, we are getting. Uh, a bit fewer audience since the morning and thank you for you all still keeping of course i would like to extend my gratitude to our colleagues from ER, yeah uh, bu wendy and also pak purbo and also pak nenga on behalf of the foundation of dondin sayuti who is also one of the sponsor and also pak nenga the one that gave a uh, very short comments he's also a one of the breeders in Sinomogus monkeys, yeah, long friends with Paramount Center as well. <laughs> and also we have a uh, representative from Taman Safari, yeah, uh, Taman Safari or Safari Park Indonesia. He's the one uh, named uh, Dr. Berto, yeah, so Berto is also a scientist from our Paramount Center now in Taman Safari. Thank you. Already attend, Mas Berto, on behalf of the sponsor. So again, uh, thank you so much also for you are still staying in the uh, Zoom, yeah, 63 person, is I, if I may see, yeah, thank you so much. And we have a quite a long hours, yeah, since in the morning, since 8 a.m. Now it's already almost five, so it's like nine hours, yeah, with, with one hour break. So I would like to just try to summarize what we've been talking about. The bottom line is that we agree that the species has a significant and important contribution for human well-being, not only human health, but also human ecosystem. And we, human, may have already made them abuse, yeah? Not quite carefully put an attention to their ecosystem. Yeah, many ecosystem degradations creating human-animal conflict here and there. We also perhaps have to be aware how also some of the misplaced culture, yeah, using the animal as a part of also art performance, yeah, which maybe also happens in other places. Those are so an abuse, yeah, and maybe some uncontrolled use of 
the animal for research which is maybe less ethical. So I guess we have to find a bridge to communicate and to advise this IUCN status of the Sinomagus monkeys to make us more alarmed, yeah? to make us more aware that we, we, we need to sit together and talk about it. So this is just a first meeting to all of us. It's not really able to convey all the stakeholders, but we are trying to gather what we have. And today, I think the meetings are, or, were, or maybe were, yeah, not, not are, but maybe were uh, applied and also attended by uh, participants and also speakers, both if we combine, there are 22 countries, yeah? US, of course, Indonesia, but this particularly with Malaysia, with Denmark, with Canada, India, and also Southeast Asia, regional Malaysia, Philippines, and I guess Dr. Robert also represent Thailand Primal Center. So all of us here and attend and hear what is the recommendations. Well, we would like to recommend that we need to talk and study more, gather more accurate data, not really to legalize, to do more and more and more exploitation, but just to have a good perspective idea on how to find the very best way of giving the best function of the primate in the ecosystem and for human, as well as how these animals are living side by side harmoniously with human. So again, uh, I would like also to extend my very, very gratitude highly to the speakers, yeah, from Denmark, yeah, Professor Jan Hao, Professor Steve Sapiro from US, and also Malin, yeah, uh, who is still also attend in the middle of uh, her son who's ill. So I hope your son is getting well soon, uh, Malin, and all speakers, yeah, from Canada, from all. Thank you so much. And again, let's not stop in this meetings, let us continue. Yeah, we in Indonesia, we'd be more than delighted to have these talks again, and we can go more details and talk about it so we can get some more concise and also exact action that we have to do. Thank you so much for all your comings and on behalf of the organizer, the Primatology Study Program, and also the Primate Center. I would like to, I would like to close this meeting and officially by knocking this microphone three times and the meeting is over. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Huda, for closing the conference. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of organizer, uh, I would like to say thank you for your active participation today. Also, today's conference is held by Primatology Study Program, Graduate School of IPB University, supported by Taman Safari Indonesia, and Donin, Nirwana Donin Sayuti Foundation, and media partners are Scorpion Indonesia Foundation, Jakarta Animal Aid Network, and International Animal Rescue Indonesia. See you on future event. I'm Fitriana, signing off. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Oh yeah. uh, also, thank you for the online participants that are coming from uh, worldwide, yeah. <laughs> All over the world. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Malin. Thank you all also, Yan Hao and everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Malin and Dr. Mary. Terima kasih banyak, Dok. Thank you, Dr. Mary. Terima kasih, Dok. Terima kasih semua. Terima kasih, Dok Uda dan semuanya. Terima kasih.
kita uh, foto dulu nggak? Halo, Halo, Pak Dedi. Pak Rem, Pak Huda, fotonya telat kalau baru mau sekarang. <laughs> Menado aman. Untuk aman. Ya. Untuk panitia mungkin bisa berkumpul untuk uh, mengambil dokumentasi terlebih dahulu. Terima kasih.